If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to me, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. So originally, I had a completely different sermon, but sometimes the Lord says, no, not that one, not yet, maybe not at all, I don't know, but he said, this is what I want you to speak on, and it's what the Lord has been teaching me for a while, just in my own personal life, and I can't help but think that when we do this today, the Lord is wanting to speak directly into some of your lives through this message, through his word. So let's open in prayer. Lord, we come to you, God, in our weakness. God, with some of our lives just being a mess. God, we come to you because you are our strength, Lord. God, we need your spirit. We ask, Holy Spirit, just like in Acts chapter 2, that you would blow in here with a mighty wind, God. That you would open the eyes and the, of the hearts in here, God. They receive your word. God, it, it's not me. It's not charisma. It's, God, it, it's your spirit that we need. God, we ask that your spirit would rain down in here, God. You would challenge, convict, and change. And God, when we leave here this morning, God, that everybody would know that they met with the living God and their lives are never the same because of that. God, we ask that your spirit would just rain in here. God, limit and, and prohibit all distractions from here, Lord. God, bind and rebuke and keep away all evil forces from this place, God. God, we ask that as we open your word and we study it, God, that you give me a power, not of this world, from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, God, anointed by your spirit, that I'm speaking the truth in love, Lord. God, my prayer this morning is that I might decrease, that you might increase, and the name of Jesus would be lifted up. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, God, the one who commands and the seas part. By your word, death flees, and you raise people up, Lord. So we ask this morning that you would be present with us, and we thank you that you're already here, Lord, in our midst. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. It's in Jesus' beautiful name I pray. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 32. We're going to talk about Jacob this morning. Uh, this is what the Lord had for me. He's been teaching me these past couple of months about Jacob. See, Jacob's interesting because he's Abraham's grandson. He was born to Isaac. Isaac was married to Rebekah. They were barren at first. And Isaac prays to the Lord, will you open her womb? And all of a sudden, she's pregnant. And she's pregnant with not just one baby, but two babies that are twins. And the twins are literally fighting in her womb. All right, we see that in Genesis 25. And she asks God, she's like, what is going on in my stomach here? Like, what, what's happening with these babies, right? And God responds to her and says, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So the first one, when they're giving birth, the first one that comes out of the womb, he's hairy and he's red. They call him Esau, and that actually means hairy, all right? When the second one's coming out, he's clutched on to Esau's heel, and they call him Jacob. The name Jacob means heel grabber, and it's associated with a deceiver, because to grab someone's heel, apparently in that culture, at that time period, was a figure of speech meaning to deceive, Okay? So they have, they have Harry and Heel. That's who we're getting with right now, all right? The twins, all right? The Bible tells us, though, that Isaac, the father, he loved Esau because Esau was a skillful hunter and that he would go and prepare food and Isaac would love to eat of the game that Esau killed. The thing about Esau is what we're, we're seeing here. He was, his every father's dream was Esau. Jacob, though, said Rebecca loved Jacob, all right? When I get the impression, if we're going to bring this into 2024, that Esau is the all-American athlete. He's strong. He's popular. He's the quarterback of the high school. All the girls like Esau. He's charming. He has charisma. Jacob, on the other hand, is quiet. Scripture says that he is a quiet man who dwells in tents. He's a nerd. All right? You would not even know that Jacob's around most of the time because Esau takes the spotlight. He's in the, the corner over there just looking like, man, I wish I could be like that guy. All right? The scripture says he's very smart, though. Jacob always feels left out. He always feels like he's not good enough for his father. Well, a, a day came when Esau comes in from hunting, and he's starving. And if you know anything about men when they're hungry, we don't just need a Snickers. We need a lot of food, right? And he comes in, and he's super hungry. He's like, listen, Jacob, you're making food. You're a cook. 
I want some, I want some of that stew. Give me some of that stew. And Jacob, like a cutthroat lawyer in this moment, goes, then sell me your birthright. Trade me your birthright right now. I'll give you this, the food. You give me the birthright. All right? And then in that moment, Esau, in a moment of just stupidity, only thinking of the here and now, decides to sell him the birthright for momentary pleasure. Thus, Jacob, the heel grabber, the deceiver, swindles his brother out of his own birthright. Then it came for the blessing of the firstborn. Isaac, their father, told Esau, he's like, listen, I'm going to give you the family inheritance. I'm going to give you the blessing. I want you to go and kill food and come prepare it the way I like it, and I'll give you your inheritance. I'll give you your blessing. See, but the problem is Rebecca, the mother, she's eavesdropping. So she comes to Jacob. She says, listen, today's the day of the, the family inheritance, the blessing. Isaac can't see very well. Like his vision's compromised. You go in there and pretend you're Esau, and you'll get the family blessing. And Jacob, being a smart man, was like, and this is what the scripture teaches. He's like, he's going to know it's not me. Like, my voice is not as deep as his. And quite frankly, I'm not as hairy as this guy. All right? The scripture says Jacob was a smooth man. All right? Esau was a hairy man. And so I could just picture this going on in 2024 as he's telling his mom, I am not strong. My chin is not as well defined. I do not have the deep robust voice that Esau has, and if he holds my hand, he'll know that it's me because I'm not, I'm not looking like a little baby Chewbacca, all right? I'm not like a little baby gorilla. He's like, I know, it, it, he'll know it's not me. And so his mom's like, I got you, son. You go get on Esau's best robe. You go get on Esau's best clothes. You walk in there, and I'm going to put goat's hair on your palms and on your neck. So when your father feels you, he's going to be like, that's my little gorilla, all right? He'll know that it's you. All right, so in that moment, he goes in there. Rebecca par- prepares the food just like Isaac wanted, just like the, he, Esau would have prepared it for. And Jacob goes in there, and Isaac thinks it's him, and he gives Jacob everything. He gives him the blessing. And then Jacob leaves, and Esau comes in, and he's like, all right, Dad, where's my blessing? And Jacob's like, or, and, and Isaac's like, I've already given you the blessing. What are you talking about? Then they realize that Jacob has cheated him out. And it says that, Esau is so mad. Isaac's mad too, but Esau is so angry in this, at this time. He literally says, I'm going to kill him. When you die, Dad, so does he. When you go, I'm killing him. Rebecca, again, heard about it. And she says, Jacob, you need to go to my brother, Laban, the Aramean. You need to get away from him because, well, he's stronger. He's more athletic. He's faster. Everything that you're not, you go to him. You get away. You run. So he did. And it's when he's with Laban that Laban mistreats him because Laban, his uncle, only sees dollar signs every time that he's doing anything. He mistreats him. He changes Jacob's wages 10 times. He deceives him multiple times. And then God tells Jacob, he says, 20 years later while he's with Laban, he says, now go back to your homeland and I'll be with you. So Jacob's like, all right, I'm going. He packs up his stuff and he leaves. And let me explain him and Laban had a deal, and God blessed Jacob, and he left with most of Laban's stuff. He is, in our culture, he would be like a millionaire at this point. When he first went there, he only had a staff. Now he's got animals and herds and servants. He's got 11 boys. Benjamin's not born yet. There will be 12 eventually. And what, what Jacob says, he sends servants to Esau, and he tells him, he's like, tell Esau, my brother, that I'm coming home. And the servants come back and they tell him, they said, listen, we told him Esau is grabbing 400 men. He's coming to meet you. In Jacob's mind, he's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. He's not over 20 years ago what I did to him. He's going to kill me. All right? It, it's very safe to assume that anybody would have gotten this oppression. 400 men would take out anything, especially Jacob. It's in verses 9 through 12 that we see his response. Jacob goes to the one who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. It says this, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I have crossed this Jordan and now I have, come, I have become two companies. Deliver me. I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with their children. 
You said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. He goes and he prays. He's like, God, I'm listening to you and I'm doing what you told me to do and I'm in a bad circumstance. I need you to intervene. Verse 24, we're going to skip down there. It says this, Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. He was completely alone and God came to him. The first thing that we see in verse 24 is that Jacob got alone. And, and that's what the Lord's been teaching me lately, if I'm being honest with you, is to just get alone with him. Don't have an agenda. Don't just seek his hand for blessing, but seek his face out of love. Right? Just sit with him. And here's the thing. When you get alone with God, God meets with you. He meets with you. You're like, oh, well, how do I know that? Well, here's the thing. Jesus always did that. All right? He would always get away for a time of prayer with the Father. He scheduled time out of his incredibly busy ministry and made time with the Father a priority. Do you do that? Do you just sit on and say, I just want to know you, Lord. I just want to know you. I want to love you, Lord. Look, I know our lives are busy. My life is busy. I have three small children. My house is beautiful chaos at all times. All right? However, if it's not too good for Jesus, it's not too good for us. Right? As Jesus walked along, every person that Jesus loved and every miracle that Jesus performed, he did as he walked. Jesus was busy, but he was not rushed. When we walk with Jesus, we might be busy, but we should never be rushed. If you're taking notes, write this down. Being busy is okay, but being rushed and hurry is never okay. Being busy is okay, but being rushed and hurried is never okay. Look at Luke chapter 8. You don't have to turn there. Jesus is walking. And all of a sudden, this man from the synagogue who's well known, that everybody knows about, his name's Jairus, he comes and he falls on his face before Jesus. And he says, Jesus, please, I have a daughter and she's 12 years old. But she's my only daughter. She's dying, Jesus. Will you come to my house and will you, will you, will you heal her? Will you help me, Jesus? Which, look, that's us as, as parents in this room. That's our only hope for our children is that they meet Jesus and he changes them, right? And so this, this man who's a godly man who's in the synagogue who's well known comes and lays his daughter at the feet of Jesus and says, come to my house, please, because my daughter needs to be healed. What, what the scripture doesn't say is that Jesus picks up his, his tunic and runs. He doesn't start to jog. He just starts walking. He just starts walking. He's like, yeah, I'll go. Let's go. And he's walking. And in the middle of his walking, there's a woman who has been bleeding internally for 12 years who grabs a hold of a tassel on Jesus' robe. Now, here's the thing about the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. We know Jairus. He's a person that everybody knows. But this woman's not even mentioned Her name's not even mentioned in Scripture. It's to show how insignificant she was. To say that she's bleeding internally, what the Greek is really talking about, is she has an uncontrollable menstrual cycle. That means she cannot have kids. That means that also, for 12 years it's been like this. She cannot go into the temple. She cannot be a part of the synagogue. She is outside of the city gates. She, when she comes around, has to scream out, unclean, unclean, unclean. Uh, you can't be around. And people scatter like roaches in her presence because to touch her from Levitical law will make everybody else unclean. She has snuck into the presence of everybody because she says, I don't have any more hope. I have to get to Jesus, and I'm not going to be able to talk to him, so I'm just going to touch his robe. But I believe in faith that just an encounter with Jesus will change everything. So she reaches out, and as Jesus is just walking, she grabs the zizol, which is a, a part of, of, of his robe. It's a tassel. And it says it yanked it in the Greek. So as he's walking, it's like, boom! And he's like, and immediately the scripture says the bleeding stopped. That she's healed. And he turns around, he's like, who touched me? And Peter walks up, and Peter's like, but Lord, everybody's around you. There's a massive crowd. Everybody's touching you. He said, no, someone touched me. And the power came out. Who was it? Now, here's the thing. Jesus knew who touched him. He's not up there being like, oh, I wonder who it is. He knew exactly who it was. He was inviting this woman to an invitation into a relationship with him. He says, you you confess where you're at. You confess, and I'm going to meet you there. All right? And so this woman, the scripture says, trembling, because she knows she can't hide anymore. She, She trembling, she comes, and she falls before Jesus. She goes, it was me. I touched you. 
I haven't been able to go to a synagogue in 12 years. I've, I've been having an uncontrollable menstrual cycle. I'm unclean. But the moment I touched you, you healed me. You healed me, Jesus. And Jesus looks at her. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. This is the only person in the scripture who Jesus calls daughter. Why? I often wondered that. Why does he call her? She's not even named in scripture. She knew in the moment when she confessed, she's not even supposed to be here. She's waiting to get pounded with rocks because she's broken the Levitical law by coming into the crowd. But yet Jesus doesn't shame her. He heals her. He looks at her, and he, I could just see him just grabbing her face and saying, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Why did he call her daughter? Because she didn't have a gyrus to come and plead at his feet. She didn't have a dad. And Jesus is saying, in this moment, I'm the one that's going to protect you. I'm the father you've been looking for, just like Jacob. I, you might not have had your father's affections, but you have the almighty God's affections. You want to know how much I love you? Look at the cross. Look at my hands. I'm here for you. I'm there. And then while this is going on, a, a servant runs up in Luke 8, and he's like, he's like Jesus. Or he tells Jairus, he said, Jairus, don't worry. Don't tell the master to come because your daughter's died. And everybody's looking at Jesus. They're like, Jesus, if you would have rushed, if you would have hurried, if you would have been there when it was supposed to be there, this woman wouldn't have died. This little girl would still be alive. She would, you're, you're wasting time with her. Because here's the thing. Luke's painting a contrast between the woman with the 12 years of bleeding and the little girl. A girl's 12 years old. She's been bleeding for 12 years. This little girl is well known in the synagogue. This woman's not even available to come. One is accepted. One is rejected. And Jesus takes a moment out of his life for both of them, just like he does you. Doesn't matter your economic uh, or, or your income. It doesn't matter your financial stability. You are precious to him. You are. And they're telling him, if you would have just came, Jesus. If you would have just been there, then this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus, again, doesn't rush, doesn't hurry, walks. Says, no, no, no. She's not dead. She's asleep. She's sleeping. She's just asleep. I'm going to wake her up. And they all laugh at him. Gets to the house where the little girl is dead. And he says, look, the mom and dad, y'all come in. Peter, James, and John, you come in. And he walks up to her and grabs her by the hand. And Mark, it says, he says, Talitha kum which is a term of endearment in this moment, where he says, sweetheart, get up. And immediately, breath comes into her lungs, and she is healed. She is restored. Why would he do that? And he's showing that even death itself will cower at the face of Jesus. When he speaks, death and sin in the grave have no power. He's saying, listen, when, even death itself is a nap when I'm in the room. He said, death itself is a nap when I'm in the room. Because when Jesus shows up, he changes everything. But all throughout this time, he wasn't hurried. He wasn't rushed. He wasn't trying to get there. Right? Here's what I want to tell you this morning. Some of you are rushing because you're trying to fulfill the American dream. We've got to do this, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do this. The problem with that is the prerequisite for knowing God is to be still. Be still and know that I am God. You know, we're trying to do all this. We're trying to be all this. I want to tell you a couple things that you should do if you struggle with this. If you struggle with rushing and you struggle with hurriedness, you need to be present in the moment. You need to choose what's important and what's not. You need to sense God's presence and recognize his voice. And all of this is going to start with stillness. Jacob was alone with, by himself. He thought that he had no one else there, but the Lord met him there. And I'm going to tell you this morning, just because you think you're alone, you are not. The Lord said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. This all starts with being alone in stillness. That's why David in Psalm 39 prays this. He says, O Lord, make me know my end and what is measured of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is nothing before you. Now that's weird. Like David was an awesome guy that, that, that could pray really well, and he prays that God would make him realize his mortality. Why? He's like, God, help me to know that I'm just a vapor in the wind, just a few hand breaths. Why? Because it puts things in perspective. Because when, when the devil comes to Eve in Genesis 3, 5, the first thing he says, if you eat this, you'll be like God. And since then, we've been trying to do that. And one of the ways that we want to be like God is we think that we're never going to die. We think that we're never going to, to, to 
have our bodies deteriorate. We're never going to get diseases. We're never going to get infections. We're never going to do this. All right? And David's saying, remind me that I'm a mortal, Lord. Remind me that I'm, that I'm going to die. Remind me. This is not a self-deprecating depression, but it's a self-aware victory. You see, to turn our lives into stillness and to busy our minds in solitude is an act of rebellion against the curse of sin. When we live in a constant state of noise, we easily will lose perspective on the things that are important. When we still are busy bodies and our busy minds and we arrive present and quiet before the God who is always present with us, it's there that he aligns us to the way things really are. It's there that our distorted desires, our messed up attachments, and our codependencies are pulled apart by his love and his pursuit of us. Look, if you live like this world is all that you have, you will exhaust yourself trying to please everybody. But Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Listen, when you stop your busy life and you get alone with God, he shapes you and molds you into his image and starts to transform your mind by his spirit. You look completely different from the world. You get a freedom where you can just admit, I'm not in control, and I'm okay with that. I'm good because of that. He's in control. Verse 25 says this. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. I think sometimes the reason we don't want to get along with the Lord is because we know when we get along with the the Lord, we're going to wrestle with him. We're going to wrestle with some things that he's done in our lives some things we don't understand. Jacob was there. You see, Jacob was told by God to go back to his homeland. Now he's traveling back, and his servants have came and said, Esau's coming. And Jacob's like, wait. He's like, God, I did what you told me to do, and now look at me. Now I'm in a worse predicament than I was in to, to begin with. I don't understand. He's nervous. He's afraid. He has anxiety. And so he starts scheming. What he did, he's like, all right, listen, I'm a smart man, so if I'll divide my camp into two camps, and if he attacks one, the other one might be able to get away. He starts doing what he's always done. And I want to tell you, some of you are in that predicament this morning. You have been following God faithfully, and then something happened in your life, something that has discouraged you, something that has made you nervous, something that has made you afraid, something that has anxiety-ridden, something that's made you angry, or maybe you're just confused this morning. And and like Jacob, you say, God, I've tried to follow you, and now look at where I'm at. But I want to tell you this morning, it's in that place of honesty and vulnerability that God meets you like he did Jacob. Let's read 25 through 30. When he saw that the man, I'm sorry, when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So, so Jacob named the place Penal. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Here's what you need to know. The man who Jacob is wrestling with is Jesus. Okay? You're like, how do you know that, Pastor Clay? I'm going to tell you. Jacob asked this man to bless him, and that would be an odd request if he reckoned him to be some stranger that just jumped him in the middle of the night. All right? Two, in the Bible, God is always the name changer. He had already done that with Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. At first, Abraham's name was Abram, and God changed his name to Abraham. His grandmother's name was Sarai, then he changed her name to Sarah. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel, okay? Finally, when the wrestling match was over, Jacob called the name of the place Penal, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. I want you to see, though, before the incarnation of Jesus in the New Testament, he was with people. In the Garden of Eden, where the Lord walked, We can safely assume that Adam and Eve strolled with him, Genesis 3. 
The Lord ate a meal prepared by Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18. He appeared to and spoke to many individuals, including Hagar, Joshua, Gideon, and he was the fourth man in the furnace, the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says this in verse 25. Let's read it again. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his hip. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. This shows in this moment that Jesus could have easily taken Jacob out. Just the touch dislocated Jacob's hip. It dislocated it. He could have easily taken him out, but he did not because he loved Jacob and had a plan for Jacob. Jesus, being divine, accommodated himself to human limitations, having more strength than we can comprehend, limited his strength in order that Jacob might win. You're like, why? Why on earth would Jesus let Jacob win this wrestling match? Why? Throughout Jacob's wrestling match with Jesus, we can gaze through a keyhole into the room of the crucifixion. The descendants of Jacob will one day lay hands on Jesus, who, in the, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The one whom Jacob pinned to the ground, who willingly lost the fight for Jacob, is the same one who was willingly pinned to the cross. Jesus took the lowly position so that Jacob could win. It's a foreshadowing of the gospel. When the day comes when Jesus will take the lowly position so that we could win. Because by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus purposely won I purposely lost so that we could win on his behalf. Verse 26, it says, Then he said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Now, now Jacob's name, again, means heel grabber. All right? All of Jacob's life, he's been a heel grabber. He's been a deceiver. He's literally started out his life by grabbing his brother's heel. He cheated Esau out of his birthright and his blessing. He took most of Laban's animals with him. Now at the end of this wrestling match, he's hanging on to God's heel. All right? Why? Because he has no other option. He's begging for a blessing, but what God does in that moment is he renames Jacob and gives him a new identity and a new purpose and a new calling in this moment. Listen, sometimes you don't get the blessings of God the way you want them because you are not ready for them. It wasn't until Jacob confessed who he was that God renamed him. All right? Sometimes God reveals things new to you, gives you a new revelation about who he is and about your calling, but it's only after you end up clinging to him rather than the things of this world that you have previously held on to. Verse 27, let's go. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Jacob asked for the blessing and Jesus said, what's your name? And he says, Jacob, why? Because Jacob his whole life had been a master manipulator. He had pretended to be Esau. And it's at this moment in Jacob's life, when he's face to face with the living, eternal, powerful God, Jesus asked him, be honest with me now. The first time in your life, be honest with me. Who are you? What's your name? And he's like, I'm Jacob. I'm the heel grabber. I'm the cheater. I'm the deceiver. I'm evil. I'm messed up. And Jesus, just like he does to us upon salvation, looks at him and goes, not anymore. You're Israel now. Isn't this how Jesus continues to reach out to us? We come to him in confession of our sin and how our nature truly is evil, and Jesus says, not anymore. You're mine now. You're adopted into my family. My blood has saved you. My sacrifice sacrifice on the cross has reconciled you. You have a new purpose. You are not a sinner anymore in the eyes of God. You are a saint because of the cross of Christ. You are not the same person anymore. But it was Jacob's confession, his confession of his previous identity. In that moment, he was called a new identity, given a new name. And this is exactly what happens to us in salvation. Exactly. You're writing notes, take this down. You are only as strong as you are honest. You are only as strong as you are honest. He was known as the heel grabber, the cheater, the deceiver. And now he's no longer known as the heel grabber, but the guy who hangs on to God. God said, Jacob won, though. Like, for you have striven with God and men and have prevailed. How in the world did Jacob win? How did he win? He won by the fact that he knew that God was, and, and, or 
he knew, he won by the fact that he knew that he was now de- completely dependent on God. See, because Jacob realized he's not bitter with his new limp that he's got, with his new blessing. He's better with it. He has God now. See, the blessing of letting go is not in your strength, but in your surrender. This is what gives you freedom. I'm going to repeat that. The blessing of letting go is not in your strength, it's in your surrender. This is what gives you freedom. If dependence is the goal, then weakness is our advantage. Sometimes it's not our strength, but our surrender that determines our ability to move forward in life. What this limp did for Jacob is it kept the pride out of his life. Because now he's walking like this. He's barely moving. You know what he's not doing? He's a millionaire now. He's not strutting. He's not walking to the newfound land with a swag. No. He's, he's leaning. He's like, oh, this hurts. This hurts. It did so much more than that, though. That limp kept him humble. That limp did a lot more than you realize. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes God weakens us so that the only place we can hold on to is him. Okay? Verse 31 says this, Now the sun rose upon him as he crossed over Penal, and he was limping because of his thigh. I want to tell you this morning, the limps that the Lord gives you, they're not going to make you late. They're not going to make you late. They're right on time. Last time we saw Jacob and Esau together, Esau said, I'm going to murder him. So I'm going to kill him. And what did Jacob do? He ran. He was like, like, I'm out of here. I'm not going to stay here. This guy's bigger, stronger, more athletic. He's got more facial hair, more hair everywhere on his body. I'm not staying around this guy. He's going to kill me. He ran. What that limp did to him was assure him that he can't run again. That God's going to fight his battles for him. That he's completely dependent on on God. The only evidence that Jacob had that he met with God was his limp. See, we oftentimes when we meet with the Lord, we think that just because we've asked God and he's going to bless us, that we're going to get exactly what we want. That we're going to, all of our circumstances that are bad are going to get better immediately. That's not what this is teaching us. Sometimes the blessing doesn't look like what you realize the blessing is, okay? But I want to tell you this, however, every time that you meet with the Lord, he changes the way you walk. Every time. Why did the God touch him and give him a limp? The limp was part of the blessing. The limp was an awareness of his need for God. He would remember, hey, listen, I met with God and God promised me I'll hold on to his truth. I don't care what society tells me. I don't care what the world tells me. I don't care what my brother Esau is going to do. I know that God's promised me and this limp will remind me of who he is. It will remind me that I'm dependent on him. See, because when you have a limp, you got to walk with a walker, or you got to have a crutch, or you got to have a cane. And he said, I don't need any of that because I'm leaning on God. He's the one that's going to help me. He's the one that's going to support me. It's a visual indicator of a deeper spiritual lesson. It's a constant reminder that he needs God and that God has a purpose for him. And I want to tell you, we all have limps. We all have scars. We all have Paul-like thorns. And those scars and those limps and those Paul-like thorns are not known. They're not supposed to be things that push us away from God, but supposed to depend on Him more. And you're like, but that doesn't sound right. I I thought God's supposed to make me healthy, wealthy, and desirable. No, God wants to make you broken in His. That's what He wants, all right? See, the, the problem with Jacob, he's always after his father's affection. He's never had it. Esau was a hunter. Jacob was a gatherer. You know, Esau was a man's man. Jacob's a mama's boy, all right? Esau was Captain America. He was Loki, all right? He was ugly, all right? Oh. What God showed Jacob was, was this, and some of you need to hear it this morning, right now. Even though you've never had your earthly father's love, you have your heavenly father's love right now. Some of you need to hear that. If you're comparing yourself to people like Jacob did, if you're always grabbing heels and you're always fighting the, the, the sin of comparison... You're always either feeling better than some or less than some, but neither one of those attributes will get you close to God. Neither one of them. Jacob's limp slowed him down. And sometimes that's what God does. He slows us down so that we're forced to look up at him. If he didn't slow down, he could have easily said, oh, Esau don't want anything of me. Look how much money I have. Look how powerful I've became. The limp forced him to rely on God. That's the blessing. 
That's the blessing. We can easily get like that. We can say, I can take this by my talents, by my gifts, my, by charisma, by my charm. I can get it. And the Lord's saying, you don't have anything unless I give it to you. That limp is going to open your eyes to your need for me, which is a blessing. It's not a curse, it's a blessing. Listen, when I got into that wreck, I had anxiety. And, and what the Lord showed me is, hey, I need him. I need him. I got to go and sit with him. I got to listen to him. I, I got to be with him. So when I look at this, I'm like, listen, I don't know if my anxiety is going to disappear tomorrow and I might not ever walk with it again, or I might struggle with the rest of my life. But I know this in this moment that I got Jesus and that's what mattered. I got him. And, and some of you need to hear that. The depression and the addictions and the, the struggles you're going through, listen, they're limps, but they're meant to bring you closer to him, not away from him. Society will tell you that your God doesn't love you, and that's a lie from Satan. He's bringing you into his love to show you you get more of him. And by his spirit, you will walk differently in front of everybody, and everybody's going to see this man's not held up by a cane or a crutch. He's held up by the spirit of the living God, and it's attractive to the world. That's what it's going to show you. In our lives, we're supposed to be in a hurry all the time. We're supposed to be rushed all the time. The problem is, the, again, the prerequisite for knowing God is this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Sometimes us slowing down is actually going to refocus on what's really important. If not, we'll try to do it by ourselves, and that's sinful. He's got a constant reminder, constant reminder the blessing that he got was not what he wanted, but what he needed. And that's what the Lord does for all of us. The life of discipleship is not about getting stronger. Understand that. When you're a disciple of Jesus, it's not about getting stronger. Rather, it's about growing increasingly aware of your weakness and the Lord's strength. I would, I would tell you this, the, the biggest spiritual giants in your lives, those pastors that you, that you listen to, those guys at the camps, those those guys that are spiritual giants, they're not people that are strong. They're people that understand that they're actually weak and their need for him. Not by power, not by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The limps are a constant reminder that we need him at all times. They always change the way we walk. And you're like, well, where does this happen any other place in Scripture? Funny you should ask. Paul says it. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for my power. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, with insults, with hardships, with persecutions, and with calamities. And when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Jacob's victory in this moment was him letting go of who he was and becoming who the Lord called him to be. Some of you this morning, you're in the same predicament. You're in the same situation. You know, what are your limps this morning? As Cammie comes up and plays... I want you to think about that. What are your limps? Are you allowing your limps, your scars, and your Paul-like thorns to draw you closer to the Lord? Maybe this, first, this is the first time today that you said, listen, I, I have not been doing that. I have not been looking at them as a blessing. I've been looking at them as a curse, and I need to repent of that. All right? I want to invite you to confess like Jacob did this morning. Like that woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She confessed, and Jesus changed her. He might not change the circumstance you're in, but he will change your heart in the circumstance, okay? Maybe you need to be honest for the first time and get right with God. Listen, you're only as strong as you are honest. Maybe you need to come to the altar and you need to pray. And you need to say, God, now I completely depend on you. Now, now it's, it's, it's where I'm at. I don't have anything. That's why I'm honest with you guys, because I'm transparent, because I'm not the hero of the story Jesus is. And stop trying to be the hero. You can't fill the shoes. He did that on the cross. Embrace surrender because that's where freedom is. So I'm going to speak some truth over you as Cammie plays. Maybe you just need to close your eyes and listen to it. Maybe you want to raise your hands. Maybe you want to stand up. Do whatever the Spirit's leading you to do. But I want to remind you today 
who our God is in the midst of these limps, in the midst of these scars, in the midst of this depression, in the midst of this addiction, in the midst of troubling marriages, in the midst of kids that have gone wayward. Can we just remember who God is in this moment? You are not to strive in your relationship with Jesus. You are to abide. In Christ, you are strong and mighty. You have the same power in you that Christ raised from the dead. You are not your past. You are not what you did. You are who Christ says you are. You are no longer Jacob in this room. You are Israel. God has said he has changed you by the cross. Don't walk in that addiction anymore. Don't walk in that depression anymore. Don't walk in that anxiety anymore. He's given you victory. You are not hostage to your unhealthy thoughts or your sinful desires. By Christ, you are set free from those things. You are not a slave of your habits. You are not a prisoner of your past. The weapons you fight with are not the weapons of this world. They have power to demolish strongholds. You have the mind of Christ directing your thoughts. You have the word of God directing your steps. Worry is not your master. You trust in God. His peace guards your mind. His peace guards your heart. His peace guards your soul in Christ Jesus. The scripture says God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Lord is your helper. You will not be afraid. You have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. God has blessed you abundantly. He has given you everything you need for all things at all times because in him you have everything you need to do all that God has called you to do. He is enough. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, not rulers, not things present, not things to come, not powers, not height, not depth, not anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. The battle rages on, but my Jesus has won the war. The battle rages on, but our Jesus has won the war. At his word, storms cease. At his word, darkness flees. At his word, demons run. At his word, sickness leaves. At his word, addiction is overcame. At his word, the lame walk. At his word, the blind see. At his word, the lepers are cleansed. Everything is held together by the word of his power. The walls of Jericho crumbled. The sea parted. The storm ceased. The dry bones came alive. In Jesus' name, anxiety disappears right now. In Jesus' name, sickness leaves. In Jesus' name, depression runs. In Jesus' name, demons tremble. In Jesus' name, darkness flees. In Jesus' name, sin is overpowered. And in Jesus' name, death has no victory. He says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Not Let not your hearts be troubled. Let them not be afraid. For the battle is not yours but God's. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Jesus says this about you. And sometimes he's given us those limps that we get more of him. 